So Wink was here. He introduced everyone, thanked everyone. Now it's our time to thank Wink. He's our fearless leader. Thank you, Wink. Now, I'm here to introduce Soheb Abbasi. And he will be moderating the last keynote with Saheed Khan. Soheb Abbasi has been CEO of Informatica Corporation since July 2004. Under his leadership, Informatica has grown almost five-fold to nearly a billion dollar in annual revenue growing twice as fast as the broader experience in software industry. So he was named Chairman of the Year as part of the 2010 Annual American Business Award for his leadership in establishing Informatica as the number one provider of data integration software. Prior to joining Informatica, so he worked at Oracle Corporation for 20 years. Most recently, as member of Oracle's executive committee and senior vice president, leading two divisions, middleware products and education services. He's a member of the board of director at Red Hat, the open source software. So he and his wife, Sarah, established the Abbasi program in Islamic studies at Stanford University to serve as a forum for interdisciplinary research and teaching. Let me welcome Soheb Abbasi. That determination can be traced Good back evening. to a childhood half a It is away, my distinct hot, dusty privilege to introduce Pakistan. tonight's keynote speaker, Shad Khan. Shad has a remarkable and inspiring immigrant to American dream life story. Shad arrived in Urbana-Champaign during one of the worst blizzards in January 1967. On his first night, he stayed at the Champaign County YMCA, and it cost him a fortune. He spent $2 for his first night in America. After graduating from University of Illinois, he joined a local auto parts company called Flex and & Gate, and after seven years, he left to start his own company, Bumper Works, and invented a one-piece design that streamlined manufacturing and improved fuel efficiency. Two years later, he bought his own prior employer. And by 2012, Flex and Gate employed 13,000 employees and generated $3.4 billion. More than two-thirds of the cars sold in the United States included, include auto parts by Flex and Gates. Now, Shad also has an interest in a biofuel startup. And when he was asked recently, how many companies do you own? Shad responded, if you can count the number of companies, you clearly don't have enough. That's the American dream. Now, as the American dream unfolds, Shad is now the owner of Jacksonville Jaguars NFL team and Fulham football team in London. Shad and his wife, Anne, founded the Han Foundation that has given millions to many worthy causes. And a full circle, Shad and his wife gave millions to the same Champaign County YMCA where Shad spent his first night in America. Please join me in extending our, our warm, rousing welcome to a true American hero, Shad Khan. Thank you, Zoheb. Um, 
I think uh, most of you have probably watched uh, 60 Minutes like I have for many, many years, and then you're waiting till the end of the episode when somebody's gonna get arrested or indicted. Um, so we kind of watched it, but fortunately this thing had a happier ending. So it's uh, one of the few 60 minute pieces that uh, somebody isn't going to jail. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's really a privilege for me to be here and uh, uh, it's a sea of salutations. Whenever I see somebody from that part of the world, I have to remind them, especially here, two great things have happened to us. One, we were born in a culture very nur nurturing with our parents that put the right values and education and really family values. And then you take that and you transpose it here uh, in the US and it's absolutely a one-two punch, a combination for success that all of you are so blessed with. Certainly I have. So you are absolutely hardwired now for success with those two elements. Uh, I'm gonna sit here with Soheb, we'll talk about a lot of stuff, but really, you know, I got here talking to the media group here, and I learned a few things as thought starters uh, that let me kind of share with you. First of all, uh, I hope you're here because you want to make a difference and you want to make a few bucks. Uh, make a buck or two. And uh, to do that, um, there is, a, this is a great business, obviously, IT, which Silicon Valley dominates. But there's a big world outside uh, IT. And uh, if you're in IT, you basically, you're number three when it comes to US global economy. Uh, healthcare would be number one, automotive number two, if you look at the whole value chain and then IT. So there's a huge world uh, that I think, uh, you know, that awaits you for all the possibilities that are out there. Uh, the other thing I've really found interesting and very different about Silicon Valley coming from really the culture I came from is uh, whenever we did something, uh, it was about, you know, when the month's over, am I going to have more money uh, than what I started out with? So the sustainability, the ability to make a profit uh, continually, and I mean, the way I started out, which was with SBA loan and life savings, the only way you got growth was profits, then borrowing and sustainability, and to this day, uh, you know, I'm still the sole owner because very, very different formula for uh, entrepreneurship. So outside uh, this world of Silicon Valley, I mean, there's a big world and there's a different approach, I think, uh, uh, that you might want to look at. Uh, and it might be eye-opening for you. So with a couple of those thoughts, you know, I'll join Soheb, and um, I think, uh, you know, I can share with you uh, what some of the key learnings were for me, and hopefully you'll get a point or two out of that. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Shad, uh, we can talk about a lot of topics. We could talk about your business, we could talk about football, but let's start with uh, the business. Uh, and let's start with, uh, the beginning. Uh, when you left your first employer, they weren't particularly happy with you when you left. Yep. And they sued you. Yep. Now, something like that never happens in technology industry. <laughs> but hypothetically, <laughs> yeah. how did you actually turn that into a victory? You actually acquired them within two years. So tell yep. us a little bit about how you did Well, um, you know, and this is where Silicon Valley is historic because uh, the laws on intellectual property really uh, got written here. Uh, when I left uh, and, you know, I'd worked for the company, they've done real well and were acquired by New York Stock Exchange, um, some of the ideas on how you ch shape metal uh, in the Midwest, if you work for General Motors or you work for U.S. Steel and you leave and you start making steel or another part, 
a judge, certainly, and this we're talking about in, really in the late 70s, uh, would have felt that really the property, everything you know, you learned from your employer on their payroll. It belongs to them. And, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, they had stopped enforcing in the late 60s employment contracts. So the law that emerged was that, uh, and the case law, that if you, uh, if you stole blueprints or you took any manuals, I mean, that was absolute no-no. You couldn't do that. But what was in your brain uh, and what you learned belonged to you. Uh, so with that, um, it was, you know, I could go and everything I had learned, I could use that and start a business. So it was really, uh, obviously I couldn't afford a lawyer in those days. I, I had to go do most of the case research myself, so I learned a lot, a lot about law. Um, and thanks for really some of the precedents that started here because the judges there were uh, very, very hesitant. And in my case, it really, uh, you know, it obviously went to the appellate court and then the Supreme Court didn't hear it. Uh, but uh, it, so what you have, the knowledge you have is your brains belongs to you. And I think what you do with it belongs to you also. Yeah, that's great. Now, you continue to actually have some uh, challenges. I understand your biggest partner and biggest customer, General Motors, decided uh, in the early days that they didn't need you. Yep. And they borrowed your idea. Yep. Uh, so that, that, how did you actually adapt was, to, yep. to losing that and then competing with them? Yeah. So Heb, I mean, this is uh, the auto industry. All your intellectual property belongs to them. So uh, that's something unique about the auto industry, and there are many reasons for it. They want to be able to control production. They're concerned about prices. Um, that you don't overcharge them. So uh, the technology I had, they never thought it would work. And once it worked, they said, you know, we got good news, we're gonna use it across our product lines. Bad news, it's not you. Um, we're gonna set up some other people in the business and, you know, have a good day. So, um, and it was, I mean, that's the, basically, that's how that world works. So uh, the evolution uh, was really vital, but an interesting th thing was happening in, in the early 80s that the Japanese were coming to the US. And I said, you know, <laughs> the jig is over. Uh, America is a great country to fail in because there are so the second acts. But before I kind of give up, uh, maybe I need to go to Japan and see if I can get those customers who were, were coming to the US. And I took some graduate students, Japanese, and I said, okay, you know, I don't have any money, but I'm gonna give you a free trip home. And you come with me to Japan, and you can translate and interpret for me, and do some cold calling. And um, so, uh, almost seamlessly, you know, we cold called on, in those days, Isuzu, Nissan, Mitsubishi, and we ended up getting all of them, because their volumes were lower, and they were looking for somebody who could, you know, they could relate to. Uh, and so you have to be able to, you know, innovate and evolve uh, all the time. And uh, uh, so, I mean, there have been many, many times where I was this close to going under. <laughs> and then you had to get up and, uh, you know, just one last time persevere. That's outstanding. So you talked about innovate. Uh, and now you're the uh, owner of uh, Jacksonville, Jaguars. And I can give you a multiple choice uh, <laughs> questions because there were so many questions that were submitted. So I'm going to give you all the questions. You answer whichever questions you okay. want. When, would, uh, when do you expect to have the first winning season? When will you get to the playoffs? When to the Super Bowl? And perhaps the most interesting of all, what business insights do you bring that you could apply to football? Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, predicting wins is a very dangerous thing. Um, what is, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of commonality between football, sports, and any business. It's people business. You have to find the best people, and you've got to empower them, and, you know, that's how you scale up a business. That's how you're successful in a business, who you choose, who you empower. Now, football is no different, but NFL football, I mean, it is about competitive balance. Uh, it is a phenomenally, it's frankly, it's a great business. I had no idea until I got into it. 
And um, so, and nobody should really be selling a football team because uh, you know the fundamentals are so good, uh, and you know when you get it, it's it has some major challenges, and it's going to take basically just like a turnaround at an auto parts company. It's going to you, you've got to go recognize it. I broke it into two parts: business and football, and separated them. Uh, you can't be, it was like, you know, we can't sell tickets, we don't have sponsorships, we, um, um, and it went on and on, and it was, you know, why? Well, we didn't get, we didn't draft T-ball, we haven't won a playoff game, etc. And uh, for me, you know, we're not selling victories. I mean, what we're selling is a great game day experience. So you've got to be able to separate that, and then... Uh, the next year, obviously, you know, we won two games and lost 14, so uh, the football people who had been there for a while, you know, they needed to do something else, like, you know, work the night shift at Denny's, you know, or, so, um, but, uh, or get on with our life, and that's basically what we did. I think we, you know, we cleaned house and uh, uh, had more success last year, and this will be a great test for us, you know. Coming so you're up. in it for the long haul? Absolutely. I think you you have to build a sustainable business for the long haul, and we have the luxury to really invest in people right. and, and facilities to do that. So That's outstanding. Yeah. Uh, changing the pace a little, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. What's the story behind the mustache? Uh, <laughs> Would you recommend a mustache to the uh, entrepreneurs for success? Well, I think is it, it's... Is it your secret uh, business differentiator? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a mustache, I think it, uh, it really, when you have individuality, uh, and I think if there are Punjabis in this room, you know, whether you're from uh, East Punjab or West Punjab, you know. I mean, it's a reflection well, of you. Well, Shad, I think you, you figured out how to relate to the audience. <laughs> So more Punjabi <laughs> jokes, please. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, um, you know, mustache from that part of the world. I've had it since 72. But, you know, I had to have it very conservative because I was selling customers. And they were already kind of suspicious. You know, you don't look the same. You don't sound the same. And so you've got to be able to assimilate. And over time, once... You know, you get beyond that where, pe uh, where people judge you and, uh, you know, you're comfortable in your own skin. That's when I said, you know, I'm going to have the mustache my grandfather used to have. <laughs> and I grew up, you know, looking at the You don't see too toilet. many of them anymore. Yeah, you, you don't. And that's too bad. Well, I start. saw some here, you know, so, <laughs> have, so that's why I felt so much at home. But, uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's our identity. I think if you're, that, if you're from Punjab, that part of the world, it's your identity. So it's... Uh, uh, How many Punjabis over here that don't have a mustache? <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> now let's talk about an industry that you know very well. Yeah. And uh, uh, for the first time in my memory, uh, automobile industry is cool in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, I can't afford a Tesla just yet. Uh, but let me ask you this. Is the technology and the automobile industries, uh, the line between them, blurring. And if it is, what is a killer idea that you can give us to create a lot of wealth for ourselves? Well, uh, oh, for, for the audience. Well, for the audience, I think uh, absolutely the lines are blurring. Um, the technology, well, first of all, the barriers to entry. Um, nobody wanted what the industry went through five years ago. I mean, it's hard to believe, but the auto industry was bankrupt. Uh, and it wiped away a lot of sins, the legacy sins, whether it was the pensions or maybe the union contract, whatever. And it's made the car companies much more open and, you know, to new ideas. Uh, I mean, I go back, I started, guy in a garage, and uh, I had, in those days, the second highest purchasing guy at Chevrolet look me out, and he said, I wanted to come and meet you because I've been here 30 years. We've never given a PO in the history of GM to a guy whose business was his briefcase. It was, well, today, I think they would do that a lot more often uh, because they need, the auto industry needs um, uh, innovation to be able to just stay up with it. Now, in honesty, uh, you know, the biggest thing Tesla is doing for the auto industry is retail model. That is, that is the most revolutionary aspect. 
uh, I think the- The retail model. The retail model, which is going directly to the consumer and bypassing the dealer. That's, they're, they're running into a lot of uh, challenges in yep. New Jersey and elsewhere. A absolutely, but I think that's the biggest revolution in the business, that they're able to take some, I mean, they have a size, they can take the dealers on, uh, really the dealer lobbies on. Basically, uh, the dealer lobbies, I mean, they, you know, I think most of you will figure out that you've got to understand how politics work. Um, they uh, have a strong lobby at the state. Why would uh, the state politicians they're getting money from, you know, want to support anybody other than the dealers? So uh, that is probably a model that needs to be revised, and I think Tesla is really revolutionizing that model. Uh, but uh, the rest of the stuff, uh, you know, when, it, when you're all said and done, uh, you, I think Tesla's got, what, 30 billion cap now? Uh, and I don't, I think they've churned, burned through a lot of cash. Uh, so at what point do you say it's worthy of 30 billion, you know, how much cash have they generated? Are you, are you questioning whether we're in a bubble? Uh, so no, I, I'm not questioning. I'm saying <laughs> the laws of Detroit, in a way, no, are different is, than is. the laws no, here. They are. They are. Uh, so, uh, but eventually, um, uh, eventually, I mean, it's not about technology. I think it's about the auto industry is ready for a revolution. It's happening right now. And you think it will come from within, or will it come from outside? Uh, the auto industry, it's it's evolution. I think that's one thing I'm really, really. Uh, I just, uh, it is not a revolutionary business. It's an evolutionary business. And uh, there's evolution in everything. The internal combustion engine, uh, you know, electricity, obviously, batteries, uh, the suspension, the chassis, the whole ball of wax. It's very, very evolutionary. Uh, and um, so, and, you know, obviously, people, you know, I mean, we're in the auto business. We love Tesla. I think it's really plowing new ground. But you look at, you know, Fisker and all the dozens of other companies that tried to do something, you know, they're not around. I right. mean, so, and there was a lot of smart money that got, you know, hosed down with some sure. of those projects. So, um, but um, auto industry is evolutionary, but very open. And I think right now um, it's, uh, and frankly, the competition, I think, uh, I ended up in auto industry quite by accident, but it was not something sexy. And I would find out, you know, the people I was competing with weren't very smart. And here, you've got a lot of smart people. So if you want to even the odds, it might be something worth looking at. So if you were making a choice today, what career would you choose now? Uh, I would use, uh, choose a career where I get a job. That's the career I'd be choosing, so I have, okay? That's uh, a very basic criteria. It's very basic. That's how I ended up in the auto industry. But I have learned, I mean, the key thing I learned was uh, that, you know, in, in my case, I mean, I went door to door looking for a job. But there were many, many different reasons. You don't have a green card. You don't know anybody. Uh, uh, certainly in the 70s, uh, you know, people were more suspicious on um, you didn't quite fit the part. So, uh, and, uh, you know, after like months of trying, I ended up with two jobs the same day. And, uh, you know, the path I chose was much, much harder, much dirtier and so on. But I thought, you know, that was the right thing to do. So uh, uh, the other well, one what, was... Uh, what gives you the drive? Yeah. I mean, you've had so many challenges early on being sued by your employer, losing your top partner. Pardon me? What gives you the drive to overcome well, well, uh, challenges? I think what gives me the drive is I, I want to make a difference. I want to make money, OK? That, that's what gives you the drive. Why? Because then you can make a difference. Uh, we need, I mean, money gives you choices. And um, the, you know, the Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, we're so lucky that stuff happened you know, 40 some years ago. And today, the real power, I think, is economic power. I think being able to vote is great. But uh, you know, if you're a homeless shelter, what good is that vote? Um, we, so to me, it was like, you know, I'm not going to fail. And I'm, I'm going to look for <laughs> another way. But uh, uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to succeed. And uh, what I found was, you know, we don't obviously have one competitor left that was in the business even 10 years ago. I mean, they're, they're all gone. Uh, and, um, but 
I think the will to win is the most important thing. In the time that remains, let me ask uh, one last question if, uh, if there is time. Uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs over here. There are even uh, repeat entrepreneurs. What advice would you give them? Uh, I think, uh, y you know, this is a country where it's okay to fail. And uh, this is a great environment to fail because you're burning up somebody else's money, okay? Uh, so <laughs> that's one of the upsides of all these angels and all these, uh, you know, uh, equity funds and investment funds. So, uh, um, uh, so, but the thing that really surprises me and I think a pe I would love for people to look at is there is a world outside IT. Take a look at that. Uh, also, the concept of cash flow that you have this great idea that can change the world, uh, how does it make money? Because you, you're gonna have to pay your bills, uh, and how do you come up with that? So I think those are the two thought starters people should think more about. Think big, think outside of IT, and make sure you never lose focus of show me the money. Absolutely, I think money is important. Okay, <laughs> well again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, okay, please. thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.